Welcome everybody. This is Ethical Hybrid Publishing, Avoiding Conflicts of Interest and Combating False Perceptions in Publishing's Fastest Growing Model. So I don't know if you heard the news or saw um, on social media or IBPA sent out a statement about it or anything, but yesterday, two UK-based authors guilds issued a highly critical report criticizing hybrid publishing, calling it vanity press, and calling it out for unethical practices and a predatory business model. They were pointing to, um, let's see, uh, companies that are just basically taking authors' money and then leaving them with no really viable path to market or selling them services that were unnecessary or poor quality. And the other, the other criticism that they had was that these companies were misrepresenting their ability to penetrate the market and their sales and distribution capacity. So how do I feel as a hybrid publisher when I hear our model being attacked like that? Well, I'm actually glad that they published that report because I agree with all of those objections. But they got one detail wrong. The practices that they described are certainly on a but they're actually not, by definition, what hybrid publishing is. They're actually antithetical to it. So we're gonna talk about that today. Um, the misrepresentation that we saw in that article is understandable and um, it's incorrect. And so it's incumbent on all of us who are playing in this space to actually really know what the definitions are and to play with them. So who am I to say all of this? <laughs> well, my name is Maggie Langrick. That's my picture. Um, I'm the publisher and founder and CEO at Wonderwell. I, um, first and foremost, I think what, um, what draws me to this business and why I feel I know what I'm talking about here is that I'm a passionate reader and particularly of nonfiction, which is the type of books that we publish. Um, it's really no exaggeration to say that nonfiction books saved my life and it improved it immediately, and they still do, you know, from my earliest years to now. Um, that's where I go. So I, I care deeply about high quality books. They really had an impact on me and my life. I'm also a member of the board of directors here at IBPA and um, the board secretary. Um, and I was um, on the advocacy committee for many years. And while I was on that advocacy committee, I was part of the working group that developed the criteria for a bona fide hybrid publisher that we published back in 2018. So I'm very, very deeply embedded in this discussion and I've explored all the angles with our peers. I'm gonna tell you more about those criteria in a little minute. Um, so my company, Wonderwell, we are a boutique hybrid publisher of nonfiction books that help, heal, and inspire because that's what I care about. Like I said, those are the books that really changed my life. Those are the books I want to publish. We're a very small shop. Um, Jen is one of our six members of our <laughs> team. <laughs> and um, we only do about 10 titles a year. So we're really, really tiny, and that's by choice. You know, that's, that's the size of operation that I feel I can manage um, well and that allows us to put out the type of quality books that we are known for. And we are known for quality. Um, our books are distributed to the trade by PGW. They have been since the start. Um, our better selling titles um, have achieved over 20,000 units and the best selling title is somewhere around 35,000 units sold through the trade, plus author copies sold. Um, we represent our authors for their um, translation rights and our books have been translated into um, over 10 different languages in different markets around the world. And I'm really proud to say that after nine years in business, we are um, one of the best respected hybrid publishers in North America. I know that to be true because I hear that from the people who come to me. Conflict of interest. So when we think of conflicts of interest, we often think about the media, right? We think about newspapers and journalistic integrity and um, what is it that people are basing their decisions upon when they publish work. We wanna trust that our news sources are telling us the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth and that it's unbiased 
and that they're not being influenced by special interests who might be paying them directly in order to influence how they're covering what the events in our world. And this is super important, right? It's really, really important for trust. Journalistic standards say that, um, that, the, that the reporter's duty is to the reader and always to the truth. So if I know that the newspaper is being paid by the person that they're writing about, that sets up at least the potential for a conflict of interest, right? Because who are they being loyal to? Are they being loyal to the truth and to the reader? Or are they being loyal to the person who's paying them? And you can't quite be sure. Well, I had an opportunity to explore and experience this sort of ethical quagmire and this, this murky zone when I myself was a newspaper editor. Before I became a publisher, I was in journalism, and I was the features editor, the arts and life editor, at the Vancouver Sun, which is Western Canada's largest newsroom. It was a paper of record for most of the west half of the country, west of Ontario, which is in the east, by the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so because I was the features editor, you know, I dealt with lifestyle material, food, fashion, and all kinds of things in, in you know, theater, things that people and organizations in our city um, you know, wanted to have favorable coverage in. We weren't covering City Hall, we weren't covering hard news. Meanwhile, the paper's decline, the re revenues overall were declining. And just as, you know, we're seeing some, you know, some, some challenges in our, in our book publishing industry too, ad revenues had bottomed out, subscriptions were down after the 2008 crash, and my bosses said, came to me and said, we'd like to explore some sponsored content initiatives with you. How do you feel about that? And as it happens, I came from a background working in custom magazines where we were creating magazines for a corporate client. So I was actually pretty comfortable about it. I said, I know how to stay on the right side of quality, how to advocate against, you know, for the sake of quality, even, you know, arguing with my client. I understand that the journalistic integrity um, needs to come from a dedication to publishing great material that is valid and well created and well sourced, et cetera, et cetera. So we managed this with some simple rules. And the simple rule was, yes, we would enter into these agreements. And it wasn't that we were writing about the people who, this was one of our rules, we weren't writing about the people that we were covering. We were placing adjacencies. So um, you know, we might have a, a, a bunch of fish recipes that ran alongside an organization that cares about you know, the, the, the fish sellers of the province or whatever. So, so there were adjacencies, and our rule of thumb was we were never going to publish anything that we wouldn't have published if it wasn't sponsored by that sponsor. And that was our rule of thumb to keep us on the right side. Ultimately, our, our commitment was to the reader and the pact that we have with them. So this set me up really well to be an ethical hybrid publisher of books. <laughs> And um, for those of you who we talked a little bit before the session started, you know, who here is already a hybrid publisher? And I know that there are a couple folks in the room to whom the model itself is new. And so we're going to just break down a few definitions. Like this attractive gentleman, <laughs> um, a hybrid publisher is the part man and part beast, right? We are sort of somewhere between a self publisher and a traditional publisher. We're a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Fundamentally, we do everything that a traditional publisher does, but our business model is different. Who funds the book is different. It's an author-subsidized model. And that means that there is a cash transaction that happens right up front. And this is exactly why it makes it, um, hybrid publishing can be uh, a great way to backstop your declining revenues or to deal with you know, these, these sort of cash flow issues because you get your cash right up front. But what that also means is that just also like this gentleman, you are on the hunt. It means that your acquisitions process is actually a sales process. It's actually business development. You're actually selling contracts to clients. And in fact, if you're doing hybrid publishing properly, that means that you're delivering most of the proceeds from the the, the sale of your books back to your author in the form of a very high royalty. And so you depend upon those, um, the value of that, uh, that contract, the fee for services. It is actually the lifeblood of your business. Obviously, as you can understand, 
there's the, the potential for conflicts of interest are just, you know, they're, they're clear, right? There is very much the potential there. And so as more and more people got attracted to this model, <laughs> this, this model, <laughs> this guy right here, <laughs> This, uh, the, the model also attracted a lot of skepticism and accusations of like, this feels really predatory, authors shouldn't have to pay, what are you doing for them in response and all of this. And people were using the term very differently to apply it to what they were doing and maybe their practices and their models were actually quite different from each other. So IDPA determined that it was really necessary, it was gonna be helpful for our entire community to get everybody on the same page as to what a hybrid publisher truly is and what it is not. So we, um, we worked in a group of, I think there were seven of us, there were traditional publishers, hybrid publishers, um, uh, author publishers, and IBPA staff. We spent four months hashing out these criteria. Um, so they're very, very well developed and not, not something that we just sort of threw together in a weekend. I can talk to you a little bit about what, what they are and where they come from. The first thing you might notice about this list is actually <laughs> The number one defining characteristic of it isn't even on here, which is that they pay us. You know, that's not actually on here. And I, I don't know whether that was just, I don't know whether it was an oversight or something that we felt goes without saying. Our, um, our imp impetus in doing this project was, um, like everybody knew that hybrid publishers were, were doing the fee-for-service business model. What we wanted to do was differentiate it from those accusations of vanity press and show why it is not vanity press. And so a hybrid publisher, in order to call themselves that legitimately, must do all of these things. The finance mission, vet submissions, I'm not going to read the whole list to you. Um, and it's only number, and when we looked at this list, we realized, like, you know what, this just describes a traditional publisher. This is like everything on here is just what a good traditional publisher does, you know, managing your rights, providing distribution. Adhering to industry standards obviously is a no-brainer, but it was really important to clarify that this is, you know, not what a predatory press might be doing. The one distinction from traditional is, of course, this number nine, and that is that a hybrid publisher must pay a royalty of greater than 50%. And that, that is in acknowledgement of this, um, this fee-for-service relationship that we have. Um, so I do want to dig into the details a little bit. So numbers one and three, um, and to a degree two, numbers one, three, three are kind of about identity, the publisher's identity and um, about their specialism and their reputation. So, you know, you're defining your publishing mission and saying this is what we are known for. This is what, not just what we believe in, but also what we deeply understand. These kinds of books and not those, like this is our specialism that we are working within. That's something that traditional publishers also do. Um, and that goes part and parcel with vetting submissions. And publishing under your own imprint means you're putting your seal of approval on that book and saying, this is our product that we are proud to stand behind. So those are numbers, numbers one through three. Um, as for, uh, yeah, oh, numbers, numbers four and five and, and a little bit two kind of seem to me to be like, when you first look at them, you're like, wait, isn't that the same thing, industry standards and ensuring quality? But there's a bit of a fine distinction, and I'm going to point it out. The difference is, not only must your books adhere to industry standards, of course they must. This is professional publishing. This is not amateur time. But, number five, it's up to you as the publisher. You're responsible, not your author. It, it's not hands-off, I'm just doing this part of it. You, it's, it's, your, it's your imprint on the spine, and you are the party that is responsible for making all of the creative decisions around making sure the creative and technical decisions that ensure that those books are uh, books of quality. Um, numbers, numbers six, seven, and eight are really all about getting that book to market. So full market penetration, everywhere that this type of book would be sold, we are able to get it there. So this is really what this is really what defines a hybrid, hybrid, hybrid publisher. And I want to make a point about distribution for a minute. There's a lot of discussion about like, is in-store distribution really essential to every book? There are many, many hybrid publishers that do not have traditional distribution that are selling online only. We do have traditional distribution. My feeling is that when your books are going into the trade, you know that you are competing with, you know, in, in a very, very, very competitive space. And you know that your titles have to actually hold their own on that bookshelf. 
even to be invited into the store, right? Even for your sales team to be able to, to, to sell it into those, those stores. And it just does cause you, I think, to raise your game. It causes you to understand the competing titles in your topic space more deeply. Um, so I think that even aside from, you know, how many copies are gonna be sold on Amazon and how many are sold in Barnes and Noble, um, there's, there's another point to be made there, which is just that you're going into the main game, the where professional publishing happens. And ultimately what this comes down to is um, that there's no corner of the market uh, that is inaccessible to you and your books. Now, there may be some people who's, um, for whom their books are, they're not necessarily for a mainstream reader, they may be for a specific population, um, but in that case, like, do you have somebody in-house who's actively selling to those organizations or groups so, or getting that book where it needs to go in order to find those readers? The point here is that active selling is going on and you're not just making it available and then stepping back from it. So this, um, this discussion that we had, as fascinating as it was, um, it raised some really interesting questions about what even is a publisher then? How do we define what a publisher is versus a vanity press or a service provider or a self-published author? What is a real publisher? And we had some really interesting conversations about it. And basically what it boiled down to is everything that you saw on the last slide, all of those, 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 those activities. But I, for, for me, I define it more simply than that. I think that a publisher of any, any sort, whether they're a self-publishing author, a hybrid publisher, or a traditional publisher, has two jobs to do. The first job is to develop viable book products, okay? It's not just about editorial services or editing. It's about creating a product that customers want to buy. Knowing what that customer wants, and making something that appeals to them. So that's job number one. Job number two is to sell it to them. Taking that book product to market in an appropriate way for that type of product. That's it, in my view. Now there are lots of our peers, especially from the traditional space, which would say that a defining characteristic of a hybrid publisher is that that per, or of a publisher is that 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 person is also the investor in the work right a publisher is the one who puts their own money into the development of that product and they are the backer of it and i don't think that's true and i'm not just saying that because that isn't my business model i'm looking historically at the way our industry has operated so even within the traditional space author subsidized publishing has been going on for a very very long time if not forever Sometimes it looks like um, buyback requirements, you know, they, they are asked to buy a certain number of copies in order to offset the publisher's risk. Sometimes there is custom publishing, which is perfectly legitimate. That is a book made for a purpose for an organization. And never did those activities call into question the legitimacy of the publisher calling itself a publisher. So that can't be a core defining feature, right? There are those who argue that unless you have skin in the game, your own money that you've invested, that you can't possibly create a work of quality. Well, I know that not to be true because that's my experience, both in newspapers and before that in magazines and in the books that we publish, which have won awards and placed on bestseller lists, national bestseller lists, your newspaper bestseller lists. I know this is not true. It is absolutely possible to do high quality work. But I also know that the person writing the checks has a lot of power in the relationship. And just as in any other human relationship dynamic, when one person has that particular kind of power over another, it can distort the way decisions are made. And so it opens you as the hybrid publisher up to the possibility of straying from your own mission and mandate to do your own two jobs really, really well. So we're talking today, I mean, the title of this talk talks about false perceptions and how to combat them. And I think that first and foremost, before you can combat any false perceptions, you need to really know your own identity. You really need to know who you are, what labels truly apply to you, 
and how those things are defined, your identity and your nature. In yesterday's report, they, you know, like I said, they called out hybrid publishing, talking them about talking about them as vanity presses. And I want to just talk about that term for a minute and ask, you know, what does that mean? What is a vanity press? And a vanity press really, it used to mean that uh, it's a company that will produce any book for money, and um, and and the implication and and usually the outcome is that that was not a book worth selling. That that was a bad book. That really the only customer for that book was its its client's ego. You know, the author's ego is like, you know, here you go. And in fact, in my night talk later today, I'm going to talk about my own father's foray into that. Um, <clears throat> but. Hybrid publishers today, people like Brooke Warner, who wrote a really brilliant um, statement in rebuttal to their statement, um, makes the case that vanity press in general is kind of an outmoded term. Because hybrid publishing, uh, self-publishing changed all of that, right? What, what vanity press means is that like, if you're paying for your own book, then it, it, it stinks and you don't deserve it. We know that isn't true. We know that it is possible to self-publish excellent books to sell them well, and for that author to be an effective publisher, remembering those two jobs, to create viable book products and sell them well, right? We know that that's possible in the self-publishing space. <coughs> we also know that it's possible to do that in the hybrid publishing space. And by the way, you know, this question of quality, the quality book, is not really one that is about the model because there are good and bad, you know, talented and not so talented, um, workers in all of those sectors, including traditional publishers. There are some whose books are better than others, let's face it. So this isn't really about, um, it's not really about who writes the checks. It's not really about who pays. If this is about predatory companies that misrepresent who they are and what they do and promise something that they can't deliver. Now money is important because if it's your own money that's on the line, you're going to be incentivized to do a good job because you know, you're the one who stands to lose. And that is true whether you're a self-publishing author or a traditional publisher who is invested in somebody else's book. If it's your cash on the line, you're going to be a really careful guardian of it. But when you are selling that service to an author, you really owe it to them to deliver on your promises, to be clear and transparent about what you can and can't do for them, and to make really careful decisions about who you enter into business with. So really, the predatory press thing that this report was complaining about is, is really about companies that will take money from an author knowing that they cannot produce the results that they're promising. And that's what we don't want to do. Now, unfortunately, or Know, just the way it is, um, because of the newness of hybrid publishing and because of these you know, associations with Vanity Press, etc., you're going to be watched. You're going to be watched super closely for how you navigate this. How diligent are you? How thoughtful are you about your program? How careful are you? And this is what we want to shake off. Okay, so the fact is, there's a very good reason for all of this skepticism that we see. And as I've already kind of alluded to, the model is really susceptible to conflicts of interest in all of these areas. So as you enter into it, you need to ask yourself, where am I potentially conflicted and how am I managing that? In selectivity. So there is a business imperative to win new clients. That's critical to your survival. And for some companies, we have seen, evidently, there's a temptation to lower standards in order to just welcome people into the program. You might be conflicted in terms of quality. Producing a really, really high quality book takes a lot of resources. And there can be a temptation to cut corners, right, in order to kind of get the thing done and move on to the next project. That's going to be an inherent tendency and temptation, you know, when you're under the gun. And, and especially, it's especially hard to maintain that quality standard if you haven't been that selective about the author that you're bringing on. You know, those people may take a lot more resources in order to get them up to publishable standards. So that brings me to pricing. Are you, are you conflicted in your pricing? Are you tempted to cut corners on the services or to 
um, to, uh, you know, there, there are companies that are boosting their profitability by selling services that aren't really useful to that author. Um, you know, like a box of bookmarks is not really going to help you sell your books, you know? Um, and in fact, there was, um, oh man, it's really chase. I actually was right. I wanted to tell you about, I talked to one author who makes me so mad. Um, they had a publisher in New York, sounds fancy, right? Um, and this publisher um, had required them to pay for a print run of 2,000 books. And that makes sense. Our print runs are often in the neighborhood of three to five to 8,000 in their first initial print run. But when I asked him about where those books were being warehoused and how they were being sold, he said, oh, no, no, they're print on demand. Yeah, exactly. And then the penny dropped in his mind and he was like, oh, if they're print on demand, why did I pay for 2,000 of them up front? So there are companies that are doing really gross, icky practices like this, okay? In terms of your sales, you know, I also hear a lot of companies that misrepresent their ability to penetrate the market by saying, you know, we are distributed worldwide, when really what they mean is that they're listed on a wholesale niche catalog. Yeah, a bookstore can order you. Are they going to know about you? Is there any active selling going on? If not, that is a misrepresentation to call that true distribution. So these are all areas where any one of us can fall prey to, you know, being conflicted when, um, when we're under the pressure. So that is the problem. <laughs> now what we want to talk about is how, <laughs> how not to be part of it. Because if any hybrid publisher does that stuff, it's a problem for all of us, right? I don't like it. I don't like to see it and go like, okay, I don't do that. So it really bothers me to hear people dragging the name of my business model through the mud by doing those shady things. But you may have grappled with these temptations yourselves, and you may have occasionally kind of strayed a little, you know, close to the line there. It's really tough. And the, the difficulty is that because this model is so new, we're all learning from each other all the time. And when we see um, other companies in our space following a certain set of practices, it can really normalize bad habits and make us think like, I, I guess that's okay. This is how they're handling it seems legit, I'm gonna do that too. It's just so important that we don't succumb to that temptation. Um, example here. In the report that was released yesterday, one of the authors said that, you know, this is British, so for 2,300 pounds, which is about like $4,000, I guess, something like that, they received an ebook, 25 physical copies, 10 posters, 25 postcards, 100 flyers, and 50 bookmarks, after which the company washed its hands of them. That doesn't sound like a publisher. That doesn't sound like a publisher whose core responsibility is creating a viable book product and then taking that book product to market, right? But you're gonna be competing against companies who are wading into these bad practices and are actively part of the problem, but none of us has to be one of those bad apples. And we just don't want to let those faulty perceptions actually be true in our case, right? So we're going to talk now about best practices for ethical hybrid publishing. There is a way to do this well. There is a way to do this successfully and in a way that allows you to hold your head up high and confront those skeptics straight on. And this is, this is so the issue here is like, the thing that you need to start off with is to hold yourself accountable to these best practices. You know that you're a business owner that needs to turn a profit, and you need to balance that out with your duty as a publisher to make viable book products and take them to market. So let's look at how to do that. The very first thing is to build your list. We are intentionally building our list here, and I talked about this a little bit on the criteria slide. Um, this is about being selective in terms of who you put who you put your efforts behind, but also developing a specialism in a particular topic space and caring about it and really cultivating that list. And what you'll find, as we have, you know, we publish nonfiction books that help, heal, and inspire. That's it. I mean, you know, there are other books out there that I might read and be interested in, but our specialism is prescriptive nonfiction and some memoir, but it has to always have 
a life enhancing health, heal, and inspire um, angle. And what that means is our editorial team is expert in developing those books. We understand how to position those books so that their design aesthetic fits within the category and that they are make appealing products to that slice of the consumer base. And our sales reps know how to sell our books because they're presenting them in the same way to the same types, to the same segments of the book trade. We're not trying to go into sporting goods stores. You know, we're not, so there's all kinds of things that we're just not doing, and that's okay. In fact, that's great. Part of building your list is really asking yourself, you know, if I was a traditional publisher, would I take on this author? Does this author meet our characteristics of the company? What you'll notice as you develop and build your list is that you will start attracting, the, you know, the power of your imprint is in your list. So you'll start attracting those authors that gravitate toward that. They want to be associated with a publisher that stands for the same things that they do. This is, means that you're going to have to say no to people who want to pay you money. <laughs> and that is really hard to do sometimes, but it's absolutely essential. Again, if you were a traditional publisher, and if you know that a traditional publisher would not take this person on, then really, should you? That's not what this is about. Like last week, we got a submission by a youngish woman who was writing, had written a manuscript um, of financial advice, investing advice for millennials. Okay, that was her premise. That sounds like it could be a kind of like a cool angle, like, you know, millennials maybe have money. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I, don't know. She, don't I actually could take issue with her whole entire thesis if I think about it, because, you know, she was like, millennials are professionals and they're like saving up all this money and they need something to do with it. And I'm like, I'm not sure if that's true, but that wasn't the problem. The bigger problem was, and she, she said this quite proudly, she said, I'm not a, I'm not a professional. I'm, I'm not a financial expert. I'm not an investment expert. I'm self-taught. I've learned it all myself. I'm really smart about it. And readers will relate to me because I'm just like them. I'm a normal person with a job in something else and I'm not a professional. Well, I know that you can't sell and effectively market a, a book of financial advice written by a non-professional, by an amateur. Like, you just can't do it. So, of course, we turned her away. But this is, this is the, these are the kinds of decisions that you have to make when you're a hybrid publisher. Be prepared to say no to people who you know um, don't stand a chance of, um, of, of achieving their goals. Uh, oh yeah, okay, here we are. Yep, it's advancing. So what this also means is that sometimes your authors are gonna need a little bit more extra help. And this is where your hybrid model can actually become a super beautiful thing because we have authors that come to us, we know that they're like, they're, you know, they're almost the whole package. They've definitely got like the legitimacy, the credibility, they've got a, you know, a, a cool, interesting idea that they have well researched and, you know, they've got the material and they've got the background and, and there's something new and interesting about what their book is about. But maybe they need a little extra coaching with the writing of the manuscript or maybe Maybe they're just at the book proposal stage and they haven't really even thought through the kind of like the big picture concept. That's okay because we can help them with that. You know, if they compensate us for that work, we have the specialisms to be able to help them outline that book and, and, and create a concept that we know. Like what I often say to them is, we wanna make sure that as you go away and write this manuscript, that the book that you're writing is one that I can sell. So let's connect at the very beginning. And in fact, sometimes we will take um, an idea or a book outline, a table of contents, and a description, and we'll run it past our sales team before we even before the author even starts writing. So we know that we're working together to make that viable book product. And it's great because a traditional publisher who's on like really tight budgets is not going to pour that sort of resource into an author who needs that much help. The same thing goes on the marketing side, and our marketing director Jen Jensen is right here, and she's she's amazing at that. But sometimes they'll come to us and say like. I've been passed over by, I've got a great book, I'm credible, blah, 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 all this stuff, but I'm still building my platform and I don't have 50,000 Instagram followers. Can you help me? Can you help me build it as well as leverage it? And we can. So these are things that you can do. We're not gonna let them go out with their pants down, right? Um, okay, 
next really, really super important thing is that you're going to have to sometimes push back on your clients. Sometimes they're going to want to say, this is fine, it doesn't need an edit, or it can just go straight to copy edit, or they're going to say, like, um, you know what, I can save some money. I've done the cover myself. I'm not paying you to do a cover for me because I've got this cover ready already. And you look at that and go, like, this is, this is like, there's no sense of positioning. It's, like, aesthetically ugly. Like, it doesn't, it's not going to, it's going to hurt the book. And you know that you're going to have to push back on them. And that can be a difficult conversation when they're like, what, are you just trying to sell me extra services I don't need? And that's an awkward conversation. But you have to be able to stand true rooted in your integrity and say, like, I think that part of what you're paying me for is my publishing expertise and my knowledge of what actually works in the market. And I know that the thing that you're proposing that we do will reflect poorly on you and reflect poorly on us, and I won't do it. So you need to make sure that your contract allows you to uphold, and that goes back to number five of the publisher criteria, right? Which is you are accountable for the quality of the product that you put your imprint on. I mean, what this really comes down to is, do you know good from bad when you're looking at these books, when you're assessing materials? If you do, then you have a duty to the publishing profession to only put out books that you know to be of high quality. And if you aren't really sure if it's good or if it's bad, you're gonna have a tough time succeeding, no matter what your model is. Part and parcel to this is scoping realistically. So when somebody comes to us and says, like I said, this doesn't need an edit, or I think you know, 50 hours is too many, you know, well, your book is 120,000 words. It's gonna take, you know, <laughs> it's gonna take some time to copy edit that well. And you need to scope for that. And you need to factor that into your fees. And again, that can be challenging because people have an idea of what these kinds of things should cost. And sometimes that idea is based on um, you know, actors that undercut and don't allow for the proper work to be done. What I know from my friends in the traditional space is, especially when you're working on a high profile book, um, a lot of resources go into that into the creation of that book. Um, well, when you have an author that needs that little extra help getting you know, up to that standard, even more so. So scope your projects realistically. Committing to transparency means transparency on a number of different things. Um, the very first thing I want to encourage you to be transparent about is your assessments of their material. And I think I've already kind of mentioned this, but you're not there to flatter them. You're not there to encourage them, primarily. Like you are there, oh, obviously you want to be a kind person. You want to be encouraging in your manner, but you're not there to, um, you know, blow sunshine in their face. <laughs> you need to tell them, like, this needs work, and that's not good enough, and this is what it takes. Being transparent about your pricing and your services and what is actually required and why you are indicating or recommending a certain set of activities and some work to be done. Letting them know, that's really, really, really important. Being transparent about your distribution and your sales capacity. And again, I think, you know, I already said this, but it frustrates me very much to see people conflating um, where, um, wholesaling or wholesale listings with true distribution because it just isn't the same. And, that author is going to come away thinking like, oh, I'm going to see it in my neighborhood bookstore. I'm going to see it in the upper wing. And if you know that you're not actually doing any active selling to get that book placed there, you're hurting them and you're hurting your own reputation by sort of hinting at it and being unclear about it, taking advantage of their ignorance. The last thing that you need to be really transparent with them about is their sales potential. You know, it may be that their book is valid and viable and high quality, but because of the kind of book that it is or the topic space that they're in, it, you know, you, you may need to set some realistic expectations. If you have an author coming in and saying, I mean, I hear it all the time, like, this is going to sell a half a million copies in its first year, and I know that, and it will be a New York Times bestseller, and, you know, like, I love their optimism and their belief in themselves, but you have to kick the, those legs out from under them because that's just, that's, you know, in almost all cases, that's not going to happen. So to be able to say, you know, our reasonable expectations are in your first six months or your first 12 months, probably in the neighborhood of 
1,200 to 3,500 copies sold, et cetera, et cetera. Be transparent with them about the likelihood or even inevitability of returns. These things will happen. You know, so to be able to kind of like bring them into an open and candid and transparent partnership, a really critical part of ethical hybrid publishing. I mean, what this boils down to is just, just be a really great publisher, you know, just, just do this job really well and cut the smoke and mirrors. That's just not part of it. I think that what we need to think about is that You know, we talked about this job of being a publisher, producing good books and getting them to market. If I'm an author publisher, it's my prerogative to set the bar low for myself if I want. If I want to just get this book out there and that's what I'm doing, you know, I just want to get it off my chest and I don't want to be bothered with editing or any of that other stuff, that's my prerogative, you know? I can put, you know, faith in myself and, uh, and do whatever it is that I want to do. But if you're a traditional or, or a hybrid publisher, the author is putting their faith in you to deliver some results to them. And so being a great publisher, um, if being an ethical publisher, it doesn't necessarily even mean being like, you know, a serious, like, um, <laughs> earnest publisher. It doesn't mean that you have to publish books that help heal and inspire or that seek to work, make the world a better place. Your contribution to humanity may be to entertain people. You know, it may be to, 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 to distract them from their worries or, you know, to make them laugh. So being a great publisher doesn't have to be some kind of like heavy, dramatic, um, uh, mission-driven thing. It could be that you publish books of fart jokes. <laughs> and that is totally valid as long as those jokes are funny. And as long as people are buying that book. So your reputation is built on policy and performance. It's your policies and adhering to those standards that I listed, that the, that the IBPA, those ethical um, standards and checklists for a bona fide hybrid publisher, those policies will lead you to better performance. And that is what you will be known for. But the thing, the thing is here that's at stake is that it's not just your reputation as a hybrid publisher, it's the way that it affects the reputation of our entire model that we're dealing with here. This is how I run my company. What I described to you today, these are all the things that I do in my business and the very tough decisions that I made. And it's part of the reason why we're so darn small and we only do 10 books a year. But it's, it's also the reason why we're one of the more expensive, you know, because I'm not cutting corners or competing on, on price. I'm going to do books that I believe in and that I can stand behind and that I know will perform well, even if that means there are very few in here that fit that description. Now, it's up to you how to run your business. And some people will decide that whatever author segment and market segment that they want to be working with is going to be more cost sensitive. And maybe they're coming at it from a different place and they're looking for different types of results. And all of that is fine. This can look many, many different ways. You know, we work with a lot of thought leaders and experts. And you might be interested in fiction and people who, you know, have a legitimately wonderful story to tell and they're really talented literary lights and, um, and they're broke. And so that's fine too. You know, you can find ways to adjust this model. It doesn't have to look the same in all ways. Whatever way you want to run your hybrid publishing operation, I want you to succeed in it. If you're struggling to adhere to your own standards of selectivity, I want you to get better at that. I want you to become a more um, competitive player on this field because that makes me a more competitive player. I want to be surrounded by amazing rock star hybrid publishers who, you know, inspire me and, you know, maybe even spark my own competitive streak. You know, we all need to be doing this. The better any of us is doing it, the better we are all doing it. Because when one of us rises up, it lifts the public perception of our entire model. And it's up to all of us to be an example of the kind of business that we would want to be associated with. You know, this is still just an emerging model. The world is still trying to figure out what a hybrid publisher is, and we're still trying to understand that for ourselves. So 
this is the time of fluidity and flux, and it's really, really, really important. You and I are collectively adding, we're building the story of what hybrid, publisher, uh, hybrid publishing is and what ethical hybrid publishing looks like. So it's up to all of us to make sure that it looks like us. Thank you.